We will now begin our afternoon panel, continuing the discussion uh, that we really began on the, on the previous panel. And I'm delighted to um, welcome our keynote speaker here, Ambassador Richard Morningstar. Um, he's the founding chairman of the Global Energy Center and a board director at the Atlantic Council. Uh, he was U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan from July 2012 to August 2014, and he served in various capacities at the Department of State, including Special Envoy for Eurasian Energy, Ambassador of the European Union, Special Advisor to the President and Secretary of State for Caspian Basin Energy Diplomacy, and Ambassador and Special Advisor to the President and Secretary of State on assistance to the newly independent states of the former Soviet Union. And prior to that, he was a Senior Vice President of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. So Ambassador Morningstar has been involved in these matters for decades, and we are delighted to welcome you. I very often just wing speeches, but I actually have some notes, so I'll do it standing up instead of uh, sitting next to uh, uh, sitting next to Angela. Uh, thank you, Angela. You know, that, with all the things that you said, my you know the various things that I've done in the government, I didn't even get to the government until I was 48 years old. So all it shows is how old I am, which I will actually talk about later when we get to the Trans-Caspian Gas Pipeline. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is a v very much of a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, Central Asia. It, it certainly is one of the most unique regions in the world, and, uh, and I, I know, but for those of you who've never been there, uh, you, you shouldn't miss it. Uh, whether it's you know, Ashgabat, which Nadja knows so well, uh, who spoke earlier today, uh, to Samar Samarkand and Bukhara, to Almaty in Kazakhstan. Uh, one of the more amazing things about Kazakhstan is their 18,000 foot mountains that come right out of the city and how close it is to the Chinese border, which uh, uh, we'll, I'll talk about a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Uh, and well, I, I will sprinkle my talk with some anecdotes, uh, and uh, well, I'll get to those in a minute. In any event, <clears throat> I am going to focus on uh, th three countries of the five stands, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, which are the most relevant from an energy standpoint, and I enjoyed hearing some of the comments uh, at, of the last panel and might actually respond <clears throat> to a few of them. Starting off with respect to Kazakhstan, uh, of course, they've been very much in the news lately because of President Nazarbayev's decision to resign after 29 years uh, as president, turning the presidency over to Kasim Joma Tokayev, who uh, many people in Washington know from his prior positions. <coughs> uh, and uh, he's really uh, very well known here. And uh, uh, he's always come across to me as a very decent person uh, and um, is a good choice, I think, by uh, uh, President Nazarbayev. And <clears throat> President Nazarbayev, I, I think more than anything else, was a master uh, at balancing the relationships uh, between uh, the, uh, that Kazakhstan has with the United States, uh, with Russia, uh, and with China, and balancing political rivalries and even family rivalries uh, within within Kazakhstan. We'll see if President Takayev can handle this, but there's also a lot of speculation uh, that uh, President Nazarbayev will really be uh, pulling the levers of power uh, from, from behind the scenes. It is interesting, I think, that President Tokayev uh, has already shown that he's trying to balance big power relationships by meeting very recently with President Putin uh, in Moscow and, I believe, entering into an agreement for the building of a, uh, a Russian nuclear plant uh, in Kazakhstan. So, again, evidence of balancing the relationships. I will make before getting specifically into the energy, some energy issues in Kazakhstan, I can't resist a couple of anecdotes. 
Uh, one, because Bill Courtney is here, who was the ambassador to Kazakhstan a long time ago when I started uh, in the government. And my very first trip as part of the United States government was in September of 1993 uh, when I led an OPIC delegation, business delegation, uh, to uh, Central Asia. And the first stop was in Kazakhstan. And I, I'll never forget getting off of the, we got off the plane at about five o'clock in the morning, and there was Ambassador Courtney uh, to greet our group. And the first thing he said to me is, you know what we're gonna do tonight? I said, nah, I don't know. And he said that he was gonna be a judge at the Miss Kazakhstan contest. <laughs> and that, and, and that I was to join him and that our whole delegation could go. And so I witnessed, I am one of the few people who actually witnessed Ambassador Courtney judging a beauty contest. And uh, it was, uh, it, it was it, I won't get into all the details, but it was, uh, it was an, a very interesting experience. <clears throat> the second, the second sort of, uh, 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 thing that I remember the most and, remember, and with President Nazarbayev is that at the time of the first gore cherna mirden Commission meeting, Vice President Gore had gone to Kazakhstan first. And you probably remember this bill in greater detail than I do, but something happened and there was a big snowstorm and his plane couldn't take off or slid off the runway or did something in Almaty and ended up st having to stay there and was entertained, I think, at the president's residence. And, and the president's family sang a lot of Kazakh folk songs to him. So you'll also remember that some months, a few months after that, President Nazarbayev came to Washington and Vice President Gore had a, I guess they called it a state dinner, it was at the State Department and he was, he, he was the host. And after the dinner was over, <coughs> Vice President Gore got up and he said, <coughs> I have a real treat for all of you here. And he told the story of what had happened in Kazakhstan. And he said, President Nazarbayev and his family will entertain us with Kazakh folk songs. So sure enough, President Nazarbayev, Mrs. Nazarbayev, and two daughters, I guess, at the time. You were there, I assume, right? And two daughters got up and sang. And the highlight was when one of the daughters uh, actually sang with a Kazakh accent, Love Me Tender. Now, <laughs> Now, there are only a few, there are a, lot of young, there are a lot of young people here, so that was an old Elvis Presley song that you may not remember, but uh, I think anybody over the age of 50 or 60 is here will, would, remember that, would remember that song well. In any event, back to, <coughs> back to energy. Uh, as you know, Kazakhstan is one of the largest, uh, uh, largest oil producers in the world. Uh, and has had a long energy relationship with uh, Western companies, and I know Chevron is a sponsor uh, of this conference and certainly has been heavily, heavily involved uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, there are three major projects uh, relating to the Caspian, on the Caspian in the Caspian area, Tengiz, uh, Kashagan, and Karashaganak. Uh, and my understanding is that the cooperation generally has been pretty good certainly during my years, uh, between the companies and uh, the government. There were always, you know, issues would come up at various times. I can remember issues on local content and local personnel being hired and so on. Uh, and sometimes trying to change the rules in the middle. Uh, <clears throat> but in spite of the ups and downs, uh, they always, these issues always seem to get, uh, always seem to get worked out. One of the first major projects of also, as far as transit from Kazakhstan, as I'm sure most of you know, is the uh, Caspian, uh, the CPC pipeline, Caspian Pipeline Consortium, by which oil was shipped west through that pipeline, transiting Russia, uh, and then out at Novorossiysk uh, to the Black Sea. I actually was at Novorossiysk when, that, when the groundbreaking was done. Uh, also, some oil gets shipped across the Caspian and into the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline. Uh, <clears throat> Tengiz has been operated by Chevron and uh, done well. 
uh, Kashagan and Karashaganak, I guess I'd say, you know, have been okay, but not quite anything like what was, uh, what was expected, not, maybe not meeting expectations. I think one of the big issues now that there's a concern about, uh, and this does relate <coughs> to uh, Tengiz, and it could relate to the Caspian Pipeline Consortium, is a concern over potential, uh, potential Russia, Russia sanctions. You have to remember that uh, Kazakhstan is landlocked. Uh, equipment for projects has to basically come through Russia uh, to get uh, to Kazakhstan. Uh, and there are some concerns that certain Russian companies are sanctioned, uh, that that could have an effect on that. Uh, there's also, I think, a more remote possibility, even more remote possibility, that since Luke Oil is a partner, that somehow they could get uh, uh, caught up in, <clears throat> in future, uh, future Russian sanctions. So this is something that is going to have to be, I think, watched carefully over the next several months and even maybe over the next couple of years. I doubt it will get to the point where these projects are affected, but I've learned a long time ago to never say never, uh, and it's something that needs to be watched, and it's important <coughs> that uh, the Hill and the administration understand the unintended consequences that could result uh, from from various sanctions uh, legislation. Uh, <clears throat> and it would, I think, be very counter uh, to U.S. policy if somehow uh, the uh, transit of uh, non-Russian non oil <clears throat> into world markets uh, was interrupted. Uh, <clears throat> On other issues, it's, uh, I think, important uh, to Kazakhstan, and I think you've heard some of this, to diversify uh, where its uh, oil and gas go to. Uh, there is more oil going to the region. For example, uh, there's an agreement now to send oil to Uzbekistan. Interestingly, in as I understand it anyway, in return for gas, which would help supply Kazakhstan during a fall season when apparently, um, apparently supplies get tight. There's oil to Russia, uh, to China some oil, and some gas through the Turkmenistan pipeline going, uh, going to China. And there's an agreement apparently f for Kazakhstan to double uh, gas supplies to China from something like 5 to 10 BCM. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, see. we'll see how that works out. Um, it's also Kazakh gas, actually somewhat similar to Turkmen gas, is a very high sulfur content, which, uh, which makes it somewhat difficult. Um, another important point, I think, on Kazakhstan to think about um, is that it's targeted by China to be very much part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and also potential you know, gas relationship uh, with China, some oil. And I think there's a real question that needs to be looked at right now is how the Kazakhstan-China relationship uh, is going to go. Uh, given <coughs> the issue with respect to Uyghurs in northwest China, uh, and remember I mentioned how close that northwest Chinese border is uh, to Kazakhstan, and the border does border Kazakhstan, and also a lot of controversy re recently over the treatment of ethnic Kazakhs uh, in, in China. Um, so uh, I think that this is something that you all should continue to keep an eye on as to what that relationship uh, is going to be, how this will be, how this will affect <coughs> other relationship, and remember you know, the geography in that whole region is so important. And remember that border. It's, uh, uh, it, it is important. Let me uh, talk about uh, Turkmenistan uh, for a few minutes. And I was happy to hear the comments by the prior panel uh, on Turkmenistan. Uh, and again, everyone should get to Ashgabat. I'll never forget my first trip back in the 90s and seeing their peace tower with a golden Turkmen bashi circulating around, uh, which I guess is uh, no longer, I think they took that part of it down at some point. Uh, but in any event, and it's also, the, the, the Turkmen border is very interesting because uh, uh, Ashgabat is very close to uh, 
Iran. And so apart from all the other issues that Turkmenistan deals with in balancing uh, Russia and China and, and the West for that matter, uh, Iran also uh, uh, is an important consideration. Uh, <clears throat> and in fact, uh, Turkmenistan does send gas to Iran uh, even now. Uh, periodically there are payment problems, but they do actually send gas to Iran. And there's always been talk about Turkmen gas going west, not through a, a gas pipeline, but through a pipeline through Iran uh, and then uh, on into Turkey. Whether that is ultimately feasible uh, and given Iran relations with the US and Europe and so forth, uh, I don't know, but it's, it does occasionally get attention. What gets the most attention <clears throat> with respect to Turkmenistan, uh, as discussed earlier, is a Transcaspian gas pipeline, uh, which would ultimately get gas to Europe through, through the southern gas corridor. Now, I have said, as Nadja reminded me uh, af during lunch, uh, that uh, I have often said, going back, I've been working on this for over 20 years, and have said, it's not going to happen during my lifetime. Uh, now, there's a problem with that, uh, and that is that I just had my 74th birthday. So <clears throat> it makes me, <clears throat> makes me a, little bit <clears throat> a little bit nervous that, uh, you know, if, if, there's, <clears throat> if there's more and more talk about this uh, Trans-Caspian pipeline, <clears throat> what effect it's ultimately going to have on, on, on my health. Uh, uh, I, I actually hope at some point there is a Transcaspian pipeline, but I still, even if I live for another 10, 20, 25 years or whatever, uh, I still think it's not going to happen during my lifetime. Um, and <clears throat> that I agree that there's been more discussion <clears throat> over the past year or so uh, with the Europeans. President Aliyev has made clear that he'd like to see something happen. And uh, I think the comment uh, uh, during the last panel that, yeah, there's a need, short term anyway, uh, for Azerbaijan uh, on gas is a reason why they might want to see either something from Petronas or, uh, or the so-called technical pipeline uh, that, was, uh, that was mentioned. Uh, but that's also, even if that were to happen, which I doubt, uh, that's very different from a big uh, Transcaspian uh, pipeline. Um, it's also interesting that uh, uh, President Trump did write a letter, uh, I guess that's part of Turkmen Independence Day or something, uh, basically encouraging, uh, encouraging uh, gas, from, uh, uh, gas from Turkmenistan. You don't hear much from Turkmenistan uh, itself. Uh, <clears throat> It's conceivably possible that there could be some pipeline connection, although I thought Nadja's comments were probably correct that platform to platform Turkmenistan uh, really, isn't, uh, uh, really isn't that interested in. Uh, but I think there are several reasons why there just won't be anytime soon uh, a large pipeline. Because uh, when talking about that kind of pipeline, generally it's been, it's been thought that it ought to be uh, a, a 30, 30 BCM pipeline. And to do that, one of the big problems in Turkmenistan has been that Turkmenistan has been unwilling ultimately, uh, and Chevron certainly has been frustrated, uh, and, and, and dealing with international oil companies uh, on the ground in Turkmenistan. They'll do service contracts, but they won't do production sharing agreements, which the big international companies are, feel very strongly about because then they can show assets uh, as part of their reserves. And, they've, and there's, they just, there just hasn't been, uh, for going back since I started looking at Turkmenistan, and I think I'm right, Nadja, that a lot of frustration in, uh, in international companies really not being able to get involved, which is really dependent on a major pipeline for financing. Uh, and uh, so that's a, a real issue. Also, Turkmenistan is all, also uh, 
uh, uh, demanded guarantees of, of purchase of 30 BCM, even if you get beyond uh, the IOC issue, uh, which is hard to get. Uh, and there's also the question of Russia. Uh, I know and have heard all the arguments that, yeah, there's been an agreement in the Caspian, uh, which is good, uh, but I don't believe that, and it's a question we were just discussing at the table earlier, a question of where the leverage is, but I, I don't believe that there'll be, that Russia will ever allow a Trans-Caspian pipeline to happen anytime soon. Certainly, in my view, not during what I hope will be an extended lifetime uh, in, in my case. Why would Russia want this to happen? Why would Russia want to see, even if all the other, all the other conditions were met, which I think would be very difficult, why would Russia ever want to see 30 BCM uh, coming from Turkmenistan uh, on, on into Europe. They're trying to build a Turkish stream pipeline, which could have, a, if successful, and I think Europe ought to be careful about this, could, could make it very difficult for expanded gas supplies coming from uh, beyond what's already pr projected for Shak Deniz, uh, but for expanded, you know, for, for expanding the, that pipeline system or getting gas from the Eastern Med, getting gas from Turkmenistan. So it's just not in Russia's interest. And I think Russia does have uh, enough leverage uh, to keep it from happening. And Russia has the leverage, among other things, it's political leverage, there's economic leverage. Uh, they are purchasing gas again from Turkmenistan. And I agree, Turkmenistan wants to diversify, and it, not just sending it to China. They do have, there is an opportunity to send it to Russia. I don't know whether that would continue if there were any real plans uh, to do, <coughs> uh, to do a, trans, uh, a, a Trans-Caspian uh, trans pipeline. China is also a major issue for Turkmenistan. Uh, I, I'll never forget six or seven years ago uh, in meeting with top leadership uh, in Turkmenistan uh, when uh, there were a lot of negative comments about the original Turkmenbashi's deal <coughs> with China. Uh, and that uh, comments like, God, we have to pay back loans. Gee, we need to, uh, uh, not only do we need to pay back loans, but we have to buy back, buy back our own gas. And also, there were all Chinese workers uh, who, who were involved in this. Maybe we, you know, maybe we made a mistake. Uh, these were the kind of comments. But I also think that <clears throat> totally setting apart Turkmenistan, these kinds of issues are important as we in the United States, uh, Europeans, come up with ways to try and counterbalance uh, a Belt and Road Initiative. And countries have to realize it's not necessarily all sweetness and light uh, in, uh, in, dealing, uh, in dealing with China. Uh, there was some mention in the, uh, prior, uh, con in the prior session about both TAPI and TAP. Uh, I feel pretty much the same about TAPI as I do about the Trans-Caspian pipeline. Uh, although I've never quite said not during my lifetime, but but very but but some of the some of the very same issues uh, relate to TAPI as relate to a Trans-Caspian pipeline. What kind of international company involvement uh, is there going to be? Uh, will it be financed? Uh, will China? I thought I thought the comment earlier uh, about you know a, a sort of a revised route maybe going. To China and maybe with Chinese funding, uh, I mean that's something to uh, uh, to uh, something something to watch. Uh, <clears throat> the the finance, but you know, financing again would be difficult. I know the Asia Development Bank has been involved to some extent over the years. Uh, that uh, still some security issues wherever it is in Afghanistan. The other thing is in Pakistan and India, there's going to be a lot more competition from LNG. Uh, and so question whether or not uh, that a TAPI pipeline, even if built, could supply gas uh, competitively uh, with LNG 
uh, uh, relatively short route, short routes from places like Iran or Qatar uh, or or wherever. Uh, <coughs> and uh, it, it, one, it, it, I do remember this was originally a Unical idea before Unical. I guess was it Chevron uni, bought Unical, uh, and. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the stories are that back in the 90s, before you know, pre-9/11 and some of the other things that went on, the Taliban used to show up in suits in New York uh, to negotiate <laughs> to negotiate over a tappy pipeline. Uh, that's that's how long that's how long it's uh, been around. I think tap is a lot more likely. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm on, on an electricity line uh, from Turkmenistan through Azerbaijan and into Pakistan. Uh, you know, there are some of the security issues, but uh, even, you know, different, even rivals in Afghanistan need to have electricity. So uh, that, I think, is something that could happen. Turkmenistan is very much behind it. Pakistan seems positive. Uh, so we'll, we'll see on that. And I, I mentioned Iran, uh, mentioned Iran earlier, uh, and uh, so I'll skip over that now. Uh, let me uh, get, go to Uzbekistan, and uh, am I going too long at this point? I can keep going for a few more minutes? Okay. Uh, another place to visit, <coughs> uh, Samarkand and Bukhara, uh, fantastic places. Uh, a lot more interest in Uzbekistan after Karima, President Karimov's death. Uh, he was there as long as President Nazarbayev. Uh, and, uh, I, I met with him several times. I, I actually found him to be quite reserved. Uh, and uh, he uh, it was interesting. I was on a trip uh, with Hillary Clinton when she was first lady back in the 90s. Uh, and we stopped in Tashkent. And we were, at, well, we, this was actually in Samarkand. And there was a huge crowd there greeting Hillary. And uh, she literally dragged President Karimov out of the car to mix in with the crowd, which was something that just apparently never happened. And uh, he just you know, didn't know what to do. Uh, but he went out, and uh, she, was, she was actually very proud of that, teaching, teaching him a little bit of uh, retail American, American politics. Um, the other thing that with, with President Karimov, every time I saw him, there would be a debate over currency convertibility, which I think is finally straightening itself out with the new government. And he argued that, there, well, we can't have currency convertibility because there are all these cheap Chinese products coming over the border. And you know we don't want them to be able to, we don't want those products. And we, and we don't want, to, uh, and we don't want to be, them to be able to convert currency. And so I was at some kind of bazaar, outside bazaar, when I was going to be meeting with him the next day. And I needed a duffel bag. And there was a duffel bag that had the name Morningstar on it. And uh, so <clears throat> I paid about a dollar and a half or whatever it was and, uh, and bought this thing. And, but Morningstar is a big name, by the way, in Central Asia. It's the national symbol of Kyrgyzstan. When I'd go see President Kakayev at the time, he would say, oh, Morningstar. And he was so happy because it was the national symbol. Any event, I went to see, so I went to see Karimov the next day. And I said, you know what happened to me? And I brought this duffel bag. Look at this. The strap tore, you know, after, ha after having it for, you know, like 15 minutes. And, uh, and he looked at me and said, you see, I'm right on the currency. Uh, <coughs> um, anyway, having said that, um, but there is a lot of new interest, I think, in Uzbekistan. President Mirzazoyev is opening up capital markets, currency more easily convertible, talking about reforms. Uh, and and he, they want to attract energy investment, uh, which, and it, I don't think it's going to be oil so much, although there are some potential projects there, given that you know, they're buying oil. Uh, and uh, there are potentials for gas, but I think the gas would be going uh, you know, north and east, which uh, uh, I'll get back to uh, in a minute. It's interesting, <coughs> they're doing a lot of work on renewables, 
Uh, Mabatolo, which is a big UAE company, which is involved uh, in renew renewables as well as conventional energy, is, has now agreements uh, to work in Uzbekistan. Uh, a lot of Russian interest. There is a small U.S. company that I had never heard of, um, Epsilon, that apparently is doing, uh, doing some exploration there. So we'll see. But things go slowly. Even with change, they go slowly. Angela, Angela and I were, I guess you're no longer on the board. I'm still on the board of the Eurasia Foundation, which Bill is chairman of. Uh, but, you know, it's going very slowly, getting re-registered there and getting our programs up and going. It's also slow for the American Councils of International Education, which I'm also on the board of. So things do go slowly, uh, but hopefully, <coughs> hopefully they'll move in the right direction. The final point that I would mention is how, how, do, how do you get, how does anybody, how do we get the U.S. more involved uh, from an economic standpoint? I think it's going to be difficult. And it's difficult because the projects that are, are leaning westward, like the existing projects, you know, whether it be Tengiz or the other projects that I mentioned, uh, they already have Western partners. Most of the new work, uh, assuming there's no Trans-Caspian pipeline, most, <clears throat> most of the new work really is re are resources that are going to go towards, probably more towards Russia and China uh, or within the region. And I question uh, how much, uh, given all the alternatives there are for investment, uh, how much American companies uh, are going to be interested in those kind of projects. Uh, I could be wrong, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, and I hope, going back to Turkmenistan, that if, in fact, Bertie Muk President Bertie Mukhamedov would finally be willing to deal with companies like Chevron and other companies, that there's still opportunity on, uh, you know, in Turkmenistan. Uh, but uh, I think it's a long road. I think I've talked enough, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for this wonderful tour d'horizon and, and, and a few personal anecdotes. So you've obviously been working in this area um, for nearly 25 years, first as assistance coordinator and then on all these energy projects. When would you say was the kind of the peak of the US interest in Central Asia? Because it's clearly declined recently. Is it only a function of Afghanistan, or what are the other reasons? Well, there's certainly an interest today <coughs> because of Afghanistan. And when we talked yeah. about the geography, mm -hmm. uh, Afghanistan obviously is uh, a principal, principal component. So there's, that, uh, there's certainly that energy uh, or that uh, interest. I think a lot of it has been with respect to transit. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in Baku, a good part of the non-lethal uh, equipment and product for Afghanistan went through went through Baku. Uh, now that's in the Caucasus, obviously, but uh, so there is that. And things went through Uzbekistan and so on. So there's been that interest. I would say that the peak came in the late 90s. That <clears throat> the policy of the United States at that point, with respect to energy from the Caspian area, was uh, to have multiple sources and multiple pipelines. So there was a lot of interest and support uh, for what Chevron was doing uh, with the Tengiz project and with the CPC pipeline. Uh, there was a huge amount of support, thing that I was hugely involved in, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, uh, and a lot of interest back then in a Trans-Caspian gas pipeline. And the reason there were in Turkey, we were very much involved with Turkey at that point on these projects. And there were three reasons, and I think this included uh, Central Asia. We, from a strategic standpoint, we felt it was important to have alternatives to Russian resources and to increase the resources. Not to cut Russia out, but to have these, uh, to have these uh, additional resources. Second, there was a real interest at that time, particularly at that time, in 
helping to uh, emphasize and support the independence of the new former Soviet countries, uh, whether it be a pipeline going through Azerbaijan and Georgia, but also uh, with respect to the Central Asian countries. Uh, the very first trip I made when I uh, ended up having the Caspian job mm -hmm. was going with uh, Mitat Balkan, who was a senior official in the Turkish Foreign Ministry, to go to, Turkmen to, go to Turkmenistan uh, to talk about a Trans-Caspian uh, pipeline. Uh, I think what happened then uh, was that I think there was, there's been, frustra there'd been some frustration uh, with the Central Asian countries. Uh, I think we've done well generally with Kazakhstan uh, and Nazarbayev, a very smart president who was able to handle his relationship with the United States. I think, though, there was a lot of frustration with Turkmenistan. The frustration grew with Karimov uh, in Uzbekistan. Uh, and so I think we, we lost interest because of the nature of the governments uh, in Central Asia. Uh, I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you. OK, we have some time for questions, comments. Everybody's sitting and thinking here. A shy group. <laughs> There's Bill, uh, Bill Courtney. Yes. You're going to ask if I remember who won the contest. <laughs> <laughs> I hesitate to ask you what yes. criteria you used, Bill. I, I will say there was no bathing suit component. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> so let me ask about, um, sorry, Bill Courtney. I'm with the RAND Corporation. Um, let me ask about competition in the energy world. So with Nord Stream 2 pipeline, this will presumably make Russia a little bit more competitive at the margin uh, in European markets. Fracking revolution has come along in the last few years and seems to have changed the economics of Arctic energy, for example. Is competition, the Caspian energy producers, are they likely to face a global energy market that's more competitive over time, becoming more competitive over time? And the, does this mean that Caspian energy producers also then really need to think hard about being more and more competitive over time? Yeah, I think that's a real issue. Um, <clears throat> in fact, what I did not mention during my comments and at, at the table, uh, one of our colleagues here from, who's here from Russia uh, was saying, and I think it's true, that uh, in a time of declining gas prices, that even if you get, were to get over all of the issues that we talked about with respect to a Trans-Caspian gas pipeline, that it would be very hard uh, to compete. Uh, you, have, you have to get the gas. Uh, the, the, the gas in Turkmenistan, for example, is not that close to the Caspian. You have to, you have to get it produced. You have to get it to the Caspian, you have to get it across the Caspian, and then on into the, uh, the existing pipeline system, maybe expanded. And I think it would be a real, a real question. I've never done the economics. Ed Chow, who just walked in, you ought to ask him uh, when, uh, during his panel. Uh, the question, Ed, being whether, Ed, Ed the question is whether uh, Caspian resources in this day and age on gas can, and, new, and new resources, like even if you got over all the hurdles on a Trans-Caspian pipeline, and I didn't die, which we talked about, uh, whether, <clears throat> whether it could even be competitive uh, in this day and age. So there, there is that issue. Uh, the first stage of Shock Denise, that's all bought, purchased, that gas, that should be okay, uh, the 10 BCM. Uh, but as far as expanded gas there and in other areas, uh, yeah, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a, a real legitimate question that you raise. Other questions? Um, you said you were going to um, talk a little bit about Iran, and then you skipped over it. Would you like to maybe say a little bit more about that? No, I mean, what I, I guess what I, yeah. was re what I was referring to on Iran is that, you know, when we talk about the Central Asian states, we tend to talk about how these states deal with Russia and China and the U.S., uh, you know, and Europe. 
Uh, and uh, Iran is right there on the Caspian Sea. Uh, they could have, you know, they want to have potential projects uh, in the Caspian. Uh, how sanctions might affect that, I'm not sure. Uh, that uh, they are close to the Turkmen border, and they have a gas relationship with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Turkmenistan. They ship, they ship gas uh, into Turkey, uh, which has somehow been excluded right. from our sanctions uh, legislation uh, over time. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to get into more, you know, more detail, setting aside what the effect of sanctions are, uh, a lot of people have suggested that uh, Iran could be a major gas supplier to Europe. Again, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Apart from sanctions, they seem, Iran seems to be more interested in shipping gas within the region and shipping gas LNG east. Uh, so, and I think there are probably enough other sources for Europe that it's uh, uh, not going to be, Iran gas is uh, not going to be at the forefront. Uh, we could get into oil sanctions, but I mean that's not really part of the Central Asia question. But yeah. yes, Andy. <clears throat> well, thanks. Um, uh, appreciate the great talk. Since you've mentioned Iran, uh, the one pipeline that uh, hasn't been mentioned, I think, so far is the possibility of Iran, Pakistan, Iran, Pakistan, India, Ippi, if not Tepi. What What do you see about? Uh, <clears throat> what do you think about the the prospects of that? Uh, I, I, I think it's certainly possible, and in a lot of ways, if obstacles can be overcome, could be easier than uh, uh, TAPI, which I think has huge obstacles. Uh, a lot of it uh, depends on how gas now is developed in Iran, uh, given that Western companies are really not part of it. Uh, who, uh, who, who, who helps to develop these resources, what companies from what countries, given the sanction situation. Uh, if, in fact, they get lifted at some point, that might, that might answer some of those questions. Uh, you know, there is a lot of gas in South Pars. Uh, if they can produce it, and if there are no, and, and depending on what the sanction situation is, I think it's very legitimate that there could be a very important LNG route uh, from uh, Iran to South Asia. And it's not very far. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, very much for your comprehensive talk. Um, I was just wondering um, how candid is the statement that the U.S. interest in Central Asian region has diminished with the disappointment in the transit changes. I think it's still, uh, U.S. interest still would be very much, and it's like almost all of its interest, interest is related to Afghanistan and the situation around Afghanistan. And my second question uh, relates to, as you're uh, speaking of uh, Iran and sanctions, I think the name is Charbahar, the, the Iranian port that is also not in the, not, not uh, to be sanctioned and it's been uh, rented by Indians as an alternative to China building a very huge transport hub in, in Pakistan. Uh, do you see it also as a part of uh, maybe counterbalancing China in that uh, region? Uh, <clears throat> one, I don't know enough about it. Uh, but f basically from what you're saying, I think that work, I think India uh, overall can play a very important role uh, in that region. Uh, and in that way, I think can be, uh, can, be to, uh, uh, can be to some extent a counterbalance. With respect to strategic interests in Central Asia, uh, my comment was why maybe some interest has been lost. Uh, that doesn't mean that I think it should have been lost. Uh, it's clearly Central Asia from a strategic standpoint is incredibly important. I mean, it's at the crossroads of um, uh, places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, 
India, China, border you know, Russia, uh, and then going and then you know going west. So uh, uh, I think that uh, there has to be uh, a balance uh, in our concerns. My guess is, and I, without judging it right, wrong, or indifferent, I think this administration is much less concerned uh, about democracy and human rights issues. I'm not saying at all that they should be, uh, but I think as a practical matter they are. Uh, and so, you know, maybe the, uh, the, the strategic uh, aspects will, you know, push it more to the forefront. The problem with U.S. foreign policy when you're dealing with that part of the world, whether it's, you know, in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, uh, other places, is there are so many priorities in U.S. foreign policy that uh, it's getting people at the right levels uh, to take a significant enough interest to develop a real strategy, whatever that's, I'm not saying what the strategy should be necessarily, but at least develop that strategy that, uh, uh, would, uh, that makes sense. And I think that basically uh, is, what's, is what's missing. We have time for one more question, if anybody has a burning question here. Otherwise, please join me in thanking Ambassador Morningstar for a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you.